Okay, to transition to this next section, um, we're going to take what we did before uh, when we were talking about um, vehicles going around a bank to track and then think about extreme examples. Um, so what we have here is uh, what we did before. I think we had like a 31 degree track uh, banked at some angle. The normal force goes off like this. We break it into an X and into a Y. And we see that this x component is providing the centripetal force. So if we imagine this angle right here to be increased, right? So a higher amount of bank. Um, well, if there's more bank uh, going on, and this is again, this is some kind of imaginary thing that we're, you know, the car is running, you know, driving at us, and we're looking into the ramp, into the bank. Um, so we're going to have a different mix of components here, and we what the we would get as an idea is it can probably withstand uh, more and more um, friction. I mean, if we if we just looked at this and said, okay, something was uh, minimally or unbanked at all, say just let's just say minimally banked, something like this, all right? So very very slight, all right? Then essentially it would you know with no friction at all, and again these are all frictionless surfaces. You know, this thing would pretty easily just take off, you know, would not, you know, stay on the thing because the normal force has a very, very small X component. Um, so what happens is that when we start to bank more and more all the way to the thing, uh, this, this X component grows quite a bit. And we can actually, um, you know, go faster and faster around this. And what we're doing is relying on that normal force to be uh, more uh, the x component of that normal force here to be uh, the um, centripetal force. And what's happening is there's getting less and less of that in the y component, right? Uh, proportional to the x, very less, uh, very much less and less, and then you know the weights staying the same. Um, and so, yeah, friction has to kind of come in at some point. But um, essentially, let's keep on thinking about this and let's go to the extremist example that we can have so I have a straight wall like this and again this is a car you know going around uh, and around um, around some central point over you know let's say over here so so some central point over here and it's kind of going around in a circle kind of like this and then back right uh, kind of think you have to think of this three dimensional. Um, so it seems like an odd idea, but it's actually something that we you may have seen before. Um, if you've been to a carnival or not a carnival, but a circus, you have the um, the guys that get into the motorcycle cage and they ride around upside down, sideways, completely whatever, and they're using the same idea. They're going in this circular path, um, and so essentially what's happening is that only one force. Right, not a component of it like this, but one complete force, the normal force, is providing that centripetal force, that inward acceleration, that inward force that causes the in inward acceleration. So we're going to look at some examples here. All right, so here's um, here's an example. This is from a old-fashioned ride called a gravitron. All right, and this gravitron, what would happen? You'd get in and you would so here's a door right here so you'd get in and um, you would stand up against a wall right now the floor was actually up here it was up here so you'd get in you'd stand against the wall and just as they so you'd be standing against the wall here uh, what would happen is that this outside would start spinning right so it starts spinning this way and again, if you do my, if you do a diagram on that, you know, at all times, you know, your velocity wants to go off in a tangent, right? So it looks like this. You know, it's a common diagram that we've been using. Um, but what happens is that the wall gets in the way, prevents you to do that, and there is an inward, um, inward force from the wall, right? So what that ends up feeling like is that you're being pushed out against that wall, right? And that's what we'd call centrifugal, a fictitious force. Really what's happening is at all times, you know, this guy wants to go screaming off in that direction, but the wall pushes him inward, right? 
and this is inward like in uh, towards the center of that circle and so the red goes on and eventually this floor drops down all right and that's the kind of the fun part because now you're pushed up against the wall as so you say and um and really what's happening is that the wall is pushing inward on you all right and then people have very interesting reactions to that all right so what actually keeps them from falling well let's look at this in more detail with uh, free body diagrams so now we're prepared to look at this with more detail um, here we're taking a, a point of view if we um, like here's the wall right here and the black dot is a you know here's the wall um, and then that black dot's a person um, you know on that on that wall kind of glued up against it so let's go through our free body diagram process okay um, first of all, uh, what forces are acting? Um, well, if I just took this person here, let's say this, this man, put a circle around him, what forces are acting on him? Well, he still exists on Earth, and he still has mass, regardless of what's going on in the, in the gravitron, so he still has weight, right? So he has weight. Okay, um... What else? He's in contact with the wall, so there's some kind of force between him and the wall. We call that a normal force, surface to surface. we got to think about what that is doing. Well, if you remember back to that diagram, that surface to surface, that you know, force is providing this kind of inward push. So I have a inward, oops, let me draw this a little better, inward normal force. Okay. Now you could say that, well, he's not moving, there's a bunch of other stuff that, you know, whatever, that things, that's enough. But if he is stuck here, right, he's stuck here, he's not, I mean, he is moving around a circle like this, but he is not moving up or down, right? That means my ups and downs must balance, all right? So right now I just have weight going down. Right, so if this is the case, guess what? He would fall. So what exactly, specifically, the question was, what is keeping him on the wall? Or keeping him up, I guess you can say. And the answer is that there is friction. There is friction going up the wall. Okay, and that's static friction because he's not moving. All right, so that static friction is equal to the weight. Right? The more weight there is, the more static friction will grow. There will be a certain limit to that, but um, well, we'll we'll see how that that works out in um, in in different equations as we go forward. Okay, but here, so this is my free body diagram, and so what is happening is my static friction cancels out with my weight. My normal force is my net force. And that net force is providing an inward direction, so that means this is also my centripetal force, okay? It's also my centripetal force. Um, so we, I, could, I could do an equation, I could do, you know, um, all kinds of work with, with using that, and then go from there, you know, of course, centripetal force is equal to mass times speed squared, Right, divided by radius. We didn't use that from there. So, uh, but the key thing is that the normal force is providing the inward net force, but friction is what's actually holding them up. Right? If this was frictionless surface, they would slide down. Okay. If you actually look at some of these people here, uh, let's say look at the, this man right here. Um, he is completely sideways. And that's okay, right? There's nothing preventing him from doing that. Um, you could get a sense that, you know, it, you know, there's kind of a force that's kind of pulling them outwards. It's not really a force, but an idea of one. Um, and what if, what if this guy could flip over? What if he could flip over and what, could he get it on his knees? Um, if he could get it on his knees, could he also maybe even stand up if this was moving fast enough? Right? Would there be... Something that, you know, enough force from this normal thing that he could actually stand up, right? Imagine him standing up, you know, towards the center there and just, you know, his feet against the wall. Is that something that is possible? 
Well, um, maybe not on Earth, but it has been thought about for other applications. And the next few slides will show that um, you know, viewpoint from space. So here's the idea. If I take a space station, and this is from the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, and if I spin the space station, so it has a certain rate at which it spins. Right? So if you are in the space station, standing in the space station here, okay, and you would, right, again, at all times, you want to be, you, your body wants you to shoot off that way. Ooh, go, go that way. But what happens is that there is a force from this floor Right, that keeps you from doing that. The floor is always keeping you from doing that, and it's particularly going to provide a inward normal force, an inward centripetal force. Right, so this is the stuff that we've been just been talking about. So one idea for future space stations, there's no such thing as an artificial gravity or anti gravity or anything else like that, um, but we could actually spin a space station and create artificial gravity in this sense. Right? Really what we're doing is we're creating a centripetal force and using the normal force of this outside. And this has been shown in movies. This is 2001 Space Odyssey. You know, I highly recommend this movie, especially if you like kind of the more artistic movies um, and kind of space movies together. Uh, the next slide here. This is also another scene from the movie, and I'll show this in class. The idea is that uh, if you had, if you're looking on the inside of a space station, this is not actually the same space station as the previous slide, um, and you rotated it. Uh, the idea is that you could continue to run, right across, you know, space station and, and around, and at all places, at all points along this outside, you would feel, you know, a gravity towards that, right? Even even the part that goes up, you know, on this wall over here. Right at all points, it's it all it's all going kind of outward, right? That's what you would feel. Of course, really, what's happening is that the the floor itself is pushing uh, inward, and I can't even draw three dimensional stuff on here, but the floor is pushing inward towards the center of the rotation right here. Uh, the kind of neat thing is, the farther out, the more simulated gravity force there would be. And so the farther in, if you actually, you know, I think there's some ladders or somewhere around here. Um, if you climb this up, right, the, um, you actually have, a, and if you're in this section right here, uh, you would actually be weightless. Um, you have apparent weightlessness, or you may be even actually weightless depending on where you are in space. Um, so, you know, the idea is out here, you're weightless, and as you climb down, Right, you climb down the stairs or whatever, then you actually become, um, you know, in a simulated weight environment. And so, really, what we're talking about is apparent weight, because we talked about weightlessness before. Um, and yeah, it depends on where you are, what kind of space station this is, and where you are. Um, if you know, like the space station around Earth, yeah, I mean, gravity is still going to have an imp influence on you. Um, we'll talk more about uh, how satellite motions kind of work. Um, but let's say that you're way off in the middle of nowhere, uh, there are no major gravitational sources around you. All right, um, I want to create a simulated gravity here, so I'm going to spin the space station. Right, so that's me on the space station there. All right, so we're going to say that there is a an apparent weight that comes from this. And what that is is the amount of normal force that supports you. Because if you remember when we were in elevators, right, we were like this. Legs, legs. Oops, that's a really bad leg. All right, and so depending if we were accelerating upward or accelerating downward, we had different apparent weights, right? And that was, in that case, the weight apparent was equal to the weight uh, plus mass times acceleration. Um, and we'll kind of revisit this in a little bit, um, slightly differently. And, um, but we have that same idea here, 
right? So it's all about, you know, the scale measures the, you know, the normal force acting on the person, all right? So if I want uh, an apparent weightlessness on the space station, I have to spin it in some kind of direction either way. Um, and that's going to make, require this normal force to push inwards, okay? And so no matter where you are on the space station, right, you will have a inward force from the, right, from the um, uh, outside of the space station here pushing you inwards to keep you in, to keep you uh, going in a circle and also kind of keep you, um, uh, you have that artificial gravity sense. Okay, so let's do this with some numbers. Um, so I'm going to draw myself on the space station. That's an awesome self-portrait. Arms here, head here, and yep. All right, so that's me. And ooh, too many arms here. All right, so um, so if I did a free body diagram for myself, and so I'll do it over onto the side. Um, well, okay, so what what forces are acting on me? Um, well, we're way, way, way far away from any Earth, Moon, Sun, all that kind of stuff. So we're just gonna have no. We're not gonna have any weight. Um, what am I in contact with? Well, I'm in contact with this floor. Um, okay, so it means that I have a normal force. And this is in this case, the normal force is going down for me. I, if I drew myself down here. Right, I would have the same same stuff going on. I would have a normal force from the surface that was pushing up. Okay, there's no friction if I'm just standing there. There's no anything else um, that I need to worry about. So for both these situations, this is the only thing going on. Right, I could draw it horizontal. I could draw it whatever. Um, so. So I say, okay, well, there's a constant inward force. Even if I'm here, there's normal force, there's norm, normal force, so on. Um, so what do I know? I know that my, if that's my only force, that my normal force is equal to my net force. And this is a net force that points inwards. If it's a net force that points inwards and provides circular motion, then that means that net for that that is a centripetal force. So essentially, my normal force is my centripetal force, and I know that, right? Um, my centripetal force needs to be mass times speed squared divided by radius. All right. So now I have to look at what do I ha what do I have? Um, I have mass is equal to uh, 60 kilograms, it's kg, and I know that uh, the diameter is 100 meters for the space station, diameter of rotation, that means my radius is 50. All right, so I'm going to use radius. Um, it completes one rotation every three minutes. So that's one rotation or one revolution per minute RPM. That is actually that's actually a measurement of frequency. All right, so it means um, one revolution or rotation doesn't matter every three minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to revolutions per second because that's really what I need. Um, so I say okay, one minute. Gives me 60, and 60 seconds, minutes cancel. All right, so I need to know the frequency from this, and I'll pause and find that. Okay, and so what I find is that um, 0 0.055 hertz, uh, also known as revolutions per second. All right, so it's a it's a small number, but again, it's you know it's taking three minutes to do one rotation. Uh, I tend to be more comfortable. Um, it's just me working in period, so um, so I'm just going to change this to period. 
because you know either one of those I can use. So I do one divided by answer. Oh, and <laughs> sorry, silly me. 180 seconds. I could have just figured that out because it takes again three minutes to do one rotation, one rotation every three minutes. Okay, silly me, silly me. So 180 seconds per period. All right, so that's all I know from here. Um, so what I need to do is um, start plugging things in. Uh, I'm trying to find uh, the apparent weight, which is the same thing as finding the normal force. Um, so essentially, uh, I'll get rid of these. These are just placeholders, bridges. Um, I know the mass. I know the radius, but I do not know the speed. So let's find speed first. Um, speed uh, is equal to uh, for a rotating object, right, 2 pi r, which is my circumference, divided by my period. So 2 pi, and my radius was 50, divided by the period of 180. Okay. So 100 times pi divided by 180. And I get a speed of 1.745 right, meters per second. So that's the speed at which this person's going. And it doesn't seem like much, and you know, in a way it isn't. Um, but again, this is a large space station that's rotating actually rather slowly. So okay, now let's gonna find this. Let's gonna find this um, normal force, which is the, essentially the parent weight. What we feel um, is my mass, that's sixty kilograms. Again, I'm using this equation here, and that is times my speed, one point uh, seven four five meters per second. Right, and that's divided by my radius, um, I'm sorry, this is squared, and then it's divided by my radius, which is 50 meters. Okay, so let's figure out what this is. Okay, when I calculate this out, I get the idea that I get 1.02 newtons of normal force. That is extremely small. Again, we'd expect, you know, a 60 kilogram astronaut to have 600 newtons of weight. But by only rotating one rotation every three minutes, right? Um, so every three minutes, we're, we're only getting one newton of force. So we must rotate it faster, right? So I want, really what I want is I want this number to be higher. Well, I can, well, okay, let's do two things. Two things I could do. I could make this number higher, right, and that would give me more no normal force. Or I could rotate at the same speed and make this thing, you know, have the same speed here and make this number lower. Um, and that introduces other kind of effects. But uh, the key thing is is that um, you actually have to spin these quite fast. Uh, again, one newton is very low. Uh, it would be some simulated gravity, but not nearly as much. Uh, let's answer this one right here. How many? How fast in RPMs um, must the Earth must it rotate to match Earth's gravity? So, let's see. Let's go over here and try to figure that out. So in that problem, Earth's gravity would say that the person would have an apparent weight of 600 newtons. Okay, so really what I want this, my parent weight, of course, is really just my normal force. That's what the force of the floor pushing on the feet. So my normal force needs to be 600 newtons. Okay, remember uh, also with these diagrams, my normal force is also the centripetal force, right, um, because it's the only thing going on which is my mass times the speed squared divided by the radius. Um, so if I know, and I'll go ahead and substitute in, I'm going to keep this around, um, but my mass is 60, and I want to find this, and I know my radius is 50, 
50 meters. Um, okay, so let's rewrite this and this together. So 600 uh, equals 60 v squared over 50. And so I'm going to do 600 times 50 and then divide it by 60. So that means 500 is equal to v squared. Take the square root. And I get 22.36. So instead of, you know, one point something, right, meters per second, it really has to be going, you have to be going 22.36 meters per second. Okay. Um, okay, so it needs to be the speed. Uh, if I wanted to know what that is in RPMs, then I have to use um, something else. So I'll use speed is equal to, for circular objects, circular moving objects, 2 pi r, which is my circumference, divided by my period. Um, actually, I'm going to go straight to frequency, because 1 over frequency, I'm oh, sorry, 1 over time is frequency, so 2 pi r times f. So, okay, v is 22.36, and then times 2 pi, my radius was 50, and I'm going to solve for f. Alright, so 22.36 divided by um, 2 pi times 50. Okay, and that gets me a frequency gives me a frequency of zero point seven one one um zero point seven sorry zero point zero seven one one um I'll say eight revolutions per second. If I multiply that by 60, that gets me a frequency of 4.27 revolutions per minute. Uh, also, this I want to convert this to a period. I did 1 over that. 1 divided by, go up here, find this. And that means it takes me 14 seconds to do one revolution, right? So both of these things I can look at. If I actually look at that, um, you know, 100 meters, that's about the length of a football field. It's also about the length of the International Space Station. So you'd have to rotate that space station, right, at 14. And so it takes only about 14 seconds to do one loop. So one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. That would have to do one entire spin during that time. And that's actually decently fast, right? And so you really have to account for that. And really, you know, the you know, only this outside level oops. Only this outside level would actually have the gravity. This inside, as you got closer, Right, uh, would actually decrease. So you have to spin it at a decently fast rate, but it's achievable, right? Um, so it's things that we have to consider: eh, future space travel, whatnot. Okay, for a more what I say down to earth example, uh, let's look at a roller coaster. We feel different apparent weights when we're on a roller coaster. Um, when we're on bottom, when we're on top, right? Because remember, apparent weight, we're going to, again, keep on linking this to my normal force. So we feel a different normal force depending on where we are. Um, in order to travel in this circle, as shown here, right? In order to travel in this circular path, right? I must have a net force inwards. Okay, so let's talk about what that net force is. Let's look at the uh, two different scenarios on top and on bottom. We're not going to look at the sides because, to be honest, those are too complicated. So 
we're not going to look at those sides. We're only going to look at the top and bottom. Again, I'll refer back to engineering physics or something when you may have to actually look at those sides. Okay, so at the top, what forces are acting on the cart right there? Um, well, it has mass. It exists near planet Earth. So it has weight going down. Okay. Uh, it's also in contact with that surface, right? If that surface wasn't there, then this thing would just shoot off in some, you know, that on that green vector there, that, you know, green uh, velocity vector there. Um, so there has to be something kind of pushing it, and it has to be actually pushing it uh, inwards, right? So actually have a normal force pushing it down. Okay, now let's look at the bottom. I still have weight, the exact same amount of weight as I had before, because I mean, remember my actual weight does not change. Um, and but and I also have a normal force from the surface. Uh, we're going to disregard friction. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that earlier. And so I have to have normal force going up. Now the key thing is I have to have a net force at all times going towards the center. So this normal force has to be greater than weight, and it must have be greater you know, to provide that net force there. All right? In this case, so this bottom case, my normal force is large. All right? Because it has to overcome weight and have enough, you know, provide enough, you know, net force left over, have enough net force left over to provide this inward acceleration. When I'm on top, though, my weight does a lot of the work. All right? It provides a downward force. So my normal force doesn't have to work that much, and it's a lazy force, right? But the key thing is when I add these two up, I get the same answer as adding these two up, right? And as when I'm talking about the same answer as net force towards the middle, if we're talking about uniform circular motion. So these two values have to be the same. And on top, it's my normal force and my weight that combine, right, that add together to be my centripetal force, and on the bottom, it's really my normal force that's, you know, canceling out with weight. And only a little bit of this normal force is left to provide the net force, right, to be the inward um, centripetal force. Okay, now we're going to do a little bit of derivation here. Um, what I've already done is drawn my uh, free body diagrams here. Oops. Uh, draw my free body diagrams here and here. Right, so these are my um, uh, for the top. Right, so this is my free body diagram for the top here. This is my free body diagram for the bottom. So what I'm going to say is that if I add these two together, right, I get a net force inward, and that net force inward provides a a um, a an amount of um, Sorry, it provides, keep it in a circle, so we're going to say that that net force is a centripetal force, which is my normal force plus my weight. Um, sorry, I didn't say it on the last slide, but we, we, we're going to adopt a little um, um, coordinate system where inward is, everything inward is positive, outward is negative. Okay, if I take this and I solve uh, for, you know, this and this, take this equation right here. Solve for normal force, which means that I subtract weight on both sides. It means my normal force is equal to my centripetal force minus my weight. And remember, um, my normal force is my apparent weight, right? It's how much feel, uh, how much I feel this thing push on me, you know, either up or down, whatever the occasion there. So if I take this um, and then just you know bring this down, bring this down, and then substitute. Uh, centripetal force, this is what I get here for when I'm on top. Uh, when I'm on bottom, though, it's a little bit different. I have a huge normal force, right? I feel like I'm, if I'm sitting there, it feels like, it feels like this seat's pushing really hard on my butt, right? Because it is. It has to, um, to overcome this weight and have enough to keep you going in a circle. Um, so I say that my normal force minus my weight, because this is going in and this is going out, Right is my net force that keeps me in a circle, so that means that's a centripetal force. All right, solve for normal force. I add weight to both sides, and so I get that my apparent weight is actually my centripetal force plus my weight. So it comes up with this equation. Okay. 
So what we're going to do now is um, mostly concentrate on the top and say what happens when my centripetal force becomes equal to the amount of force this is becomes equal to the same amount as the weight. All right, so let's look at that in the next slide. Okay, so let's play with some math and some concepts here. Um, first, let's look at the concepts. In order to keep going in this circle, right, there needs to be a net force inward in order for that to happen. All right, no net force, um, that's kind of constant, then no circular motion. All right, so um, let's play a game. Uh, let's play a game where we slow down this coaster this loop on this coaster. And each time we get in, we go through a little bit slower. All right? If I play that game, what happens is this velocity changes. It decreases. If this decreases, then this value also decreases. Okay? If this centripetal and this is the centripetal force or the net force essentially here. So what happens when this decreases to a point where this entire value is equal to the same amount of the weight. So essentially what happens to that? If this goes to the same value of whatever the weight is, then this becomes essentially whatever that number is minus that same number. My normal force goes to zero. Right? The normal force will now be zero. And so what that person in that, um, in here right here, would actually experience is actually a bit of weightlessness, right? Because there's no apparent weight, right? The normal force is zero. There's no apparent weight left, right? And this is also the critical speed, the critical velocity, right? If, you, if, my, if my centripetal force here is only due to the weight, right? If I slow down, if I slow down right here, if I slow down right there, and I only have that, then essentially, if I did a free body diagram at that point, then my free body diagram is I have weight going down. And, well, okay, if I said normal force is zero, then I no longer have a normal force. So this is my only force going on. So basically, this is my net force, which means it's also my centripetal force. So this right here, this centripetal force is equal to my weight, mass times gravity, right? This would actually be a period of weightlessness for the occupant, right? Only for this brief time right there. And so if I go with this, right, because this is zero and I solve and so on, and if I solve for this speed, which we'll call a critical velocity or critical speed, right, my masses cancel. And I do R multiplied by R on both sides and take square root, and I get something called a critical velocity. Now this is basically the, the minimal speed that you can do a loop. And this could be a loop on a roller coaster, this could be a loop of um, a bucket of water above your head, uh, a loop of anything else, a ball on a string, right? Um, you know, this is the speed at which it must go um, around in order for it to actually maintain that circular motion. And it only depends on gravitational acceleration of the planet or the, wherever you are and the radius uh, of this circle, right? So if I, let's see, if I increase the gravitational acceleration of the planet, then actually I can have, um, I need more speed, right, in order to do that to make a loop. Um, if I increase the radius of the loop, I also need more speed. If I decrease the radius, then my critical speed actually decreases. So I could make this, you know, a tighter loop like this, right? It doesn't take as much speed to go through uh, all that. Uh, if I made it a bigger loop like this, I'm going to have to actually have more speed throughout that entire process. All right? So this is really roller coaster design and how everything works. Okay, so another kind of amusement or uh, circus type um, application here, right? We have this um, globe of death, 
you know, these motorcycles get in here and they just, they spin around, you know, over and over again. They do horizontal, they do vertical, right? So, um, you know, essentially if they're going over the top like this, uh, then what speed much must they go in order to make it over the top without falling down, right? They can go faster than speed, but what's the critical speed at which they must be going over the top before they, you know, they fall down? Or really good something else like this. All right, so the same application applies. Uh, the last one we had a roller coaster loop de loop like this, right? But this is the same the same thing, all right? So um, the equation from the last sheet, I'm sorry, last slide was my critical velocity is equal to the square root of the gravitational acceleration times the radius. Okay, gravitational acceleration. 9.8 meters per second squared and that's being multiplied by the radius um, the radius of 2 meters 2.2 sorry 2.2 meters so let's multiply those together and then take the square root so square root of 9.8 times 2.2 and I get um, oops, I'm going to get rid of this and just say I get um, a value that is 4.64 meters per second. Essentially, that is also, if I, that's about 10 miles per hour. Okay, so my critical velocity, it must be going you know, 4.64 meters per second or about 10 miles per hour in order to make that turn. Right, which is, I mean, slow, but you know, when you're in this kind of very small cage, you know, that's, that's pretty decent. Okay, it's that simple. Uh, this is not something that is in your equation sheet. This is something that you uh, probably should remember, and also understand how you got to that point. And meaning, um, you know, what is the free body diagram? You know, of the weight, you know, and the normal force for this top, and then what happens when my um, centrip my net force basically you know this normal force shrinks to zero and my weight is that so you know yeah. understand this but also it probably helps to memorize this okay uh, so let's see next one is how fast in revolutions per minute must I rotate a bucket of water um, over my head to keep it um, in, uh, in order to keep all the water in the bucket so it doesn't fall out. Essentially, if you're not going fast enough, you know, this is just going to fall out, right? So assume that the distance from my shoulder to the bottom of the bucket, otherwise known as what we'll say the radius, is 1.2 meters. So how fast does it need to be going? Well, if I remember this shortcut equation, then I'm okay. Uh, GR. It only depends on the planet that you're on and the radius. All right, so g 9.8 meters per second squared and the radius is 1.2 okay that's you know length of an arm so I say square root of 9.8 times 1.2 alright so my critical speed is 3.429 and this is meters per second Really, 3.43 from keep with the three sig fig convention. Okay, critical speed. All right, anything slower than that, then it's gonna slosh down. Anything faster than that, well, it's just gonna have a little bit more normal force. Again, you know, in all these kind of cases, the bottom of the bucket is keeping, right, this going, you know, in a circle. Why is it keeping that? Because it, that bottom of the bucket is uh, attached to the handle, right? And then that handle is attached to the string, right? So technically, there's a tension that's kind of providing that normal that uh, centripetal force. But really, what's you know ultimately doing you know keeping the bucket the water in the bucket is that normal force there. Okay, so that's a 3.43. That's roughly about um, um, that's roughly about eight. Mm, yeah, 7.5 miles per hour, 